The Marathon, 26.2 miles of pounding your legs on the pavement in your nearest big city just to not be able to walk for the next three days. It's hard to believe that some people actually do this for fun, but if you've ever run a marathon or even a half marathon, you may understand why people continue to come back to this seemingly torturous event. The PR, that's right, running faster than you've ever run before, pushing through the pain and basking in the endorphins and glory of beating past you. The concept of improvement and overall greatness is addictive to us, which is why we keep coming back trying to run fast and faster. This same principle applies to the best elite runners, in addition to monetary incentives to run fast and break world records. Recently, on October 8th, 2023, Kelvin Kiptum from Kenya broke the marathon world record running two hours flat in 35 seconds. That's 436 per mile for 26.2 miles. Yeah, absolutely blazing. This broke the previous world record by 34 seconds, held by the great Eliud Kipchoge at 201.09. Now, with marathon times getting so fast and quickly approaching the sub two hour mark, you you may be wondering, how fast is it physically possible to run a marathon? There's got to be a limit, right? While Eliud Kipchoge may not agree, science will suggest in every case that there is in fact a limit and there will be some threshold time in which humans will cap out at eventually. In an article from the 1990 Journal of Applied Physiology, American physiologist Michael Joyner proposed a hypothetical marathon time of 1 hour 57 minutes and 58 seconds. This article was fascinating at the time as it suggested there were nearly 9 minutes to shave off of the current world record of 206.50 back in 1990. Let's break down the science and math behind Joyner's optimal marathon performance. So there are three primary physiological factors that go into one's marathon running speed. These are VO2 max, lactate threshold, and running economy. VO2 max is simply the maximum rate of oxygen your body can consume during intense exercise. I'm talking intense, like pretty much all out. For running, imagine a pace you can hold for approximately 10 minutes. VO2 max is measured in milliliters of oxygen per kilo kilogram of body weight per minute. Typically, VO2 max values for elite marathon runners range from around 70 to 84 milliliters per kilogram per minute. It's worth noting that VO2 max values higher than 84 have been reported in humans. However, this seems to be practically the max value you will see for an elite marathon runner specifically. Think of VO2 max as the maximum performance of a car engine. Just instead of using gas as fuel, we're using oxygen. Next up is lactate threshold. Lactate is a byproduct produced as a result of glucose utilization by your muscles. When you run at fast paces, lactate starts to accumulate in your blood, releasing acidic hydrogen ions, which causes that sweet burning feeling we all know and love. Now your body will try to reconvert this lactate into useful energy, but there becomes a certain point in which the production of this lactate becomes too much for your body to get rid of. It is at this pace where you are said to be running at lactate threshold. The concentration of lactate in your blood at which this occurs is typically around 4 millimoles per liter, however it will vary from person to person. Lactate threshold pace is commonly described as the pace you could hold for an all-out hour running effort. Now, since the marathon event is well longer than an hour, lactate threshold pace is certainly not achievable. But nonetheless, the ability to clear lactate at fast paces plays a huge role in how fast one can run over the full marathon distance. Another important metric is the percentage of VO2 max pace one can hold when at lactate threshold. A little confusing, so more on that later. Lastly, and certainly not least, running economy. How efficient are you at a certain running pace? This variable is heavily related to running form along with body type. Running economy can be measured as the steady state oxygen consumption for a given running speed. A runner with a greater economy will tend to work at a lower percentage of VO2 max than a runner who requires a lot of oxygen and therefore has poor economy. For example, two marathon runners may share an identical VO2 max and lactate threshold. However, if one marathon runner sticks his butt out and flails his arms during the whole race, you can imagine who is going to finish the race faster. Just like how VO2 max can be compared to a car engine, running economy can be thought of as the car's gas mileage. How many miles to the gallon or miles per amount of oxygen can I get? Now that the three primary physiological factors that go into a marathon have been explained, let's take a look at how Joyner models the elusive 157 marathon. Mathematically, Joyner's formula really isn't that hard to understand. He calculates an individual's marathon running speed as VO2 max times the percentage of VO2 max at lactate threshold times running economy. Now the units are a little bit all over the place, but it works out to be kilometers per hour over the course of 42.19 five kilometers, aka the marathon distance. A quick note on this second lactate threshold term, I know I said lactate threshold pace is what you can hold for about an hour. Well, Joyner here is saying that lactate threshold is closely related to the fraction of VO2 max that can be sustained during a full marathon race. So not an hour, but two plus hours perhaps. I sort of have an issue with the way Joyner presents this second lactate threshold term, but I'll get into that later. Anyways, the idea here is now with some quality lab data, we could technically calculate marathon times. Assuming Joyner's model 
model is accurate, of course. I mean, you could calculate your ideal marathon time at home if you knew all these values. However, Joyner takes several possible values from elite runners into consideration to calculate and compare a range of possible marathon times. For VO2 max, Joyner took a study of 19 elite runners whose laboratory VO2 maxes varied from 71.3 to 84.4. He then takes three VO2 max values for later calculations, one at a minimum, one at an average, and then one at a maximum. Joyner actually chose 70 as the low value instead of the recorded 71 because of old reports of a marathon world record holder with a VO2 max of just 70. For lactate threshold, things get a little more confusing. I mentioned earlier that four millimoles per liter is a common blood lactate concentration where lactate threshold is reached. It was found by a variety of other studies during the 70s that elite marathon runners can put up with two to three millimoles per liter of lactate in their blood during a marathon race, which makes sense as a pace slower than lactate threshold is required to run a full marathon. This is going a little above and beyond what's really important in Joyner's marathon speed equation. The importance of lactate threshold is its close relation to what percentage of VO2 max one can utilize throughout the duration of a full marathon race. Several studies from the 70s and 80s found that the best elite marathoners are able to run the marathon at speeds that require upwards of 85% of VO2 max. It's noted that some outlier studies found runners who could sustain 90% of VO2 max over the course of a marathon. However, just like the abnormally high VO2 max values reported in some individuals, this 90% value was not used in this study. Again, Joyner took the low average and high values of percentage of VO2 max able to be held during a marathon, resulting in 75, 80, and 85% being considered. Lastly, for running economy, Joyner plotted data on running speed versus oxygen consumption for several different elite runners. For the most part, the relationship was found to follow a linear pattern with oxygen consumption having a direct correlation with running speed. Now, this data was taken from subjects running on a treadmill for brief periods of time, so two additional factors were taken into consideration. One, wind resistance. Obviously, on a treadmill, there is no headwind generated from running, so Joyner assumed a 7 to 8% reduction and running economy that would most probably occur due to wind resistance from outdoor overground running alone. Two is what Joyner and others call VO2 drift. Over the course of two plus hours of running, the uptake of oxygen required was assumed to be two to three percentage more on average compared to the brief measurement of oxygen consumption in the shorter running span treadmill study. Just like VO2 max and percentage of VO2 max able to be utilized in a marathon, Joyner created three different linear regression plots for running economy based on laboratory data. A low and an average and a high. The estimated 10% reduction in running economy was not built into these plots alone, rather multiplied in at the end when predicting actual marathon times. So we've laid out the groundwork and mathematical basis, now let's look at Joyner's results. I mentioned Joyner made running economy plots comparing oxygen consumption to running speed, and really at this point all you need to reference to calculate marathon running speed are these equations that represent these plots. Just like I said, Joyner comes up with three different lines of varying running economies to predict marathon speed. He then uses the low, medium, and high values of both VO2 max and percentage of VO2 max sustainable in a marathon to come up with a 3 by 3 by 3 matrix of possible elite marathon running speeds. Now all you do is divide your marathon distance by the calculated marathon running speed, multiply by 0.9 to account for the 10% reduction, and boom, you have your marathon running time results. So 27 possible marathon times are calculated, with the slowest being 255.49, and the fastest being our elusive 157.58. To be clear, this 157.58 marathon is supposedly for a subject with an 84 VO2 max, a lactate threshold allowing 85% of VO2 max running pace to be held, all while maintaining outstanding running economy throughout the marathon. In a long story short, according to Joyner, all you need to run a fast marathon are exceptional values in VO2 max, lactate threshold, and running economy. Oh really? That's all I need? Well, easier said than done. Now, at the time this article was published, three of Joyner's calculated marathon times exceeded the world record of 206.50 which suggested that physiologically there was quite a bit of improvement to be made here. That is, if Joyner's model was truly accurate. Now, Joyner does admit some potential errors and limitations in the model. He first mentions that the genetic probability of observing a subject with maximal values in VO2 max, lactate threshold, and running economy is extremely unlikely, if possible at all. The question from here becomes, are exceptional values for more than one of these variables mutually exclusive? Do we know specific relationships between VO2 max, lactate threshold, and running 
growing economy. Well, not completely, but a variety of studies suggest that both extremely high values for VO2 max and running economy are rarely seen in the same person. In a more recent article from Joyner in 2011, he highlights the importance of running economy in relation to the dominance of East African runners in the marathon. Joyner states that East African runners don't typically possess exceptional values in VO2 max or lactate threshold, but are able to perform so well in the marathon due to their extraordinary running economy. A fun fact about this article is that Joyner actually predicted that a sub two marathon would be run in either 2023 or 2024, which would be crazy if that actually happens this year because we are very close. Anyways, it's certain to say that more data is required to seek a better relationship between our three variables. Another shortcoming in Joyner's model is how he extrapolated the running economy plots. So I mentioned earlier that Joyner plotted data for running speed versus oxygen consumption in a short lab treadmill experiment that only had 12 subjects. The data seemed to follow a linear fit, but I didn't mention that the maximum running speed data points were only at 17.7 kilometers an hour. So for any speeds higher than this, Joyner didn't have any oxygen consumption data relating to the study. Joyner did have other anecdotal data to suggest that the linear trend would continue at faster running speeds, although this was completely separate from anything measured in the lab. Well, the running speed required to run a 157.58 marathon is 21.46 kilometers per hour. And again, this assumed a linear relationship between running speed and oxygen consumption. The question here is, would we expect the trend to remain linear at upwards of sub two hour marathon pace and even faster? It's a reasonable assumption, but it's hard to say for sure. One last thing to mention is that Joyner doesn't account for any possibility of performance impacting muscle fatigue in his perfect marathon. You know, like at mile 20, when your legs suddenly turn into concrete pillars. We're talking about a marathon, 26 miles of glycogen depletion and multiple body malfunction issues just waiting to happen. But with Joyner's model, we assume that the appropriate muscles are able to fire and contract at the same rate without any loss of performance throughout, which is believable in many cases, I suppose. I mean, look at Kelvin Kiptum and his ability to negative split marathons by a sizable margin. Anyways, this is pretty much the summary of Joyner's study in 1990, but if I may, I'd like to add some extra points and criticism of my own. First is sort of my confusion with Joyner's second term in the marathon speed equation, that being percentage of VO2 max at lactate threshold. I've sort of been dodging explicitly stating this term, and here's why. Using this term here means to me that one would be able to hold lactate threshold pace for the duration of an entire marathon. And we have a what? contradiction here, since lactate threshold pace is well known to be a pace that can be held for around an hour of running, not upwards of two hours. With this in mind, it doesn't appear that the 157 marathon is possible. It would be too fast, right? Well, I suppose the lactate threshold term here is taken out of context, as again, Joyner is really stressing the fact that there is data to suggest that one can hold 85% of VO2 max pace for the entire marathon race which is essentially what's important for that term. Maybe I'm missing something here, but yeah, definitely a little confusing. Another thing that I think Joyner fails to detail is that the 10% reduction in running speed is really a rough estimate at best. I talked about the effects of wind resistance and VO2 drift, but really there's a lack of quality data here to say that this will add up to 10% exactly. Think of this, say our perfect subject runs the entire marathon on a treadmill and only the two to 3% VO2 drift reduction in running speed is at effect. This would suggest that around an an hour and 49 minute marathon is possible on a treadmill. I don't know guys, maybe, but that's right around 411 per mile pace just does not seem realistic. But back to Joyner's 157, we would have to assume that 10% is an accurate reduction and there seems to me like there are too many other variables at play. For instance, is our runner assumed to be traveling in a straight line the entire time? Are slight time losses for drinking fluids accounted for? Are weather conditions perfect? Are we certain the race is exactly 42.195 kilometers? Not every marathon course is perfect. Even the Berlin Marathon, which is considered the fastest legitimate marathon course in the world, has several turns and small hills. Anyways, my point here is that we can only lend so much credence to this 10% reduction factor. In reality, it could be more, could be less. It seems very difficult to predict. Now, one obvious thing I think which may help support the running of a time as fast as 157 is shoe technology. I'm talking super shoes. Joyner's study took place back in 1990, and to be honest, back then, I'm not really sure what kind of shoes elite marathon runners were wearing. All I know is that now, with modern racing shoes containing carbon fiber and super responsive foams, we may need to update our running economy plot. 
plots, at least by a little. It's difficult to say what degree these plots would be affected, and remember, they weren't necessarily 100% accurate to begin with. But you can imagine it definitely supports the idea that running even as fast as 157.58 is possible. Again, if we believe the rest of Joyner's model is accurate. I think it'd be very interesting to repeat a case study like this in the year of 2024 to see any new results we may come up with. I mean, there has to be better lab data now on everything, and I'm guaranteeing we could model a more accurate, perfect marathon now versus 34 years ago. The science and physiology behind marathon running is truly mind-blowing, and I think for sure we will see some faster marathon times in the near future. That's about all I have to say on this. I hope you guys enjoyed this sort of technical breakdown on the perfect marathon. Let me know what you all think in the comments below. I'd love to spark up some more discussion on this super interesting and sort of forgotten article. If you enjoyed this content, like the video, subscribe to the channel. It would help me out immensely. Anyways, I'll see you guys in the next video.